start here. So the newspaper says global warming causing extinctions. And the person's pondering how many species do I need. Um, and, and this probably isn't as much of an issue for the, the folks in this room. I think it's pretty good appreciation for the, the water that we have here in, in, in the state and in northern Michigan. But, you know, we're, we're not talking about flooding. We're not talking about loss of, of uh, uh, property due to changes in coastline. We're not talking about crop damage or potholes. Um, we're talking about, I'm going to talk about fish habitat. And so oftentimes that, that falls pretty low on the list um, when people are concerned about the effects of climate change. Uh, but I'll, I'll echo some of the points that were made earlier. Um, you know, it is important, of course, to think about our water, uh, uh, our lakes and streams, and the, and the fisheries that they support. Um, our you know, healthy lakes and streams have an aesthetic value. Uh, they generate a lot of, um, they have a lot of recreational value, um, which you know, improves the quality of life of, of our citizens. Uh, many of the communities, uh, economies of, of many of the local communities depend on the tourism that's generated from those recreational um, dollars. Um, and people like to live near the water. And so healthy, healthy lakes and streams also influence the property values. So while it's not potholes and crops or ski season, it, it, it is still something that we, we should value. And I, uh, I kind of went back to the, the anticipated outcomes of the uh, of the summit to help structure what I was talking about, and, and I just um, highlighted a few things here. So the risk again, I, I'm going to focus more on the um, from the side of uh, fish habitat um, and primarily in lakes. And I'm going to draw on um, three different examples. One from um, Wisconsin lakes, one from um, Michigan lakes, and one from Minnesota lakes um, to help illustrate my, my uh, take home messages. And I'm going to give you those now um, that, that I'm down to four minutes. Um, <laughs> and that is uh, that our lakes and streams and the fish species and the communities that they support have been changing and they're going to continue to change. Uh, some of these changes are, are, are simple to understand. They're directly related to changes in temperature and stream flows. But other of these changes are much more complicated and there's, and there's uncertainty involved with that. Um, some of the changes are due to species inter interactions. Um, some of the changes are due to uh, climate plus what we're doing on the landscape in terms of agriculture and urban development. Those are harder to disentangle and to know what the, the actual effects will be in the future. Um, and there's also uh, uh, complications due to the fact that we fragmented um, fragmented our waterscapes through, the, through uh, uh, lake level control structures and dams. We'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, when we look at Recent climate change and future climate change, there are winners and losers. There are species that are highly vulnerable to climate change, and there are other species that will benefit. Some of the species that will benefit are going to be invasive species. And will incur some, some costs associated with their, their uh, continued establishment of, of new species and spread of existing species. Um, Waters in the northern part of the state are, gonna, are, are probably the most vulnerable to climate change, and we're likely going to see the greatest amount of habitat change and changes in, in um, fish communities and species in the north. And that occurs for a variety of reasons. Um, and so that, that sort of gets at the, the, the assets that are vulnerable, um, potential solutions. I'm going to plant the seed, um, protecting our watersheds and shorelines, um, especially for waters that we know are, are that we project to be resilient to climate change will be critical. Um, 
kind of harkens back to what Dave, Dave said about more forest. Um, uh, my friend in Minnesota talks about protecting the sponge, protect the watershed that feeds, feeds your waters. Um, restoration, so restoring, repairing, and watershed forest cover will also, also be important, and that's to uh, reduce storm flows, uh, to enhance recharge, and to most importantly, uh, or arguably most importantly, uh, reduce nutrient inputs to water bodies. Uh, and so then also implementing uh, repairing and watershed best management practices to help mitigate um, the effects of climate change by reducing nutrients and sediment inputs. And then finally, um, we need to think about eliminating barriers um, to allow things to, to migrate um, in the face of climate change. All right, so that's my talk. Um, those are my messages. And the rest is just going to be interesting uh, graphics, I guess. So uh, you, you've all seen this already. Um, this is also, these are also figures from Jeff Andreessen at MSU showing the observed temperature and precipitation changes. Um, Dave just showed this as well. Um, there is there is scattering here, but the overall trend is an increase in the mean annual air temperature and an increase in the mean annual precipitation. As fish ecologists, we're pretty concerned about this. When you, when you look at the factors that determine where species live and, and how well they grow and, and, and their abundance and the kinds of fisheries, the, uh, uh, those have the, uh, the kinds of fisheries or the quality of fisheries, um, water temperature and stream flow are the two top variables that explain most of that in the state. Um, so we're very concerned by increases or changes in temperature and, and precipitation because it influences the key drivers of fish habitat. I'm going to um, talk primarily about lakes. Um, Dave touched a little bit on the, the effects on, on streams. Um, all my examples I'm going to talk about here are for lakes, but um, there are similar arguments or, or <coughs> examples um, for stream environments uh, showing a, a, a change in uh, fish habitat with recent climate change and dramatic changes with future climate change. And I'll, I'll just, well, we'll start here. Um, this is some data from um, Luke Winslow and others out of uh, the USGS in Wisconsin, um, and they hindcasted uh, lake temperatures from 1979 to 2015. And this is for degree days, and this is similar to like the, the length of the growing season for crops or heating degree days for thinking about heating homes. Um, and what it shows is that uh, there, there has been an in increase in temperatures uh, across the, typically call these the Midwest glacial lakes here. Um, but interestingly, you'll see the, the dark colors in the state of Michigan. Lakes in Michigan have warmed faster um, since 1979 than the other lakes in the region, with the exception of, of that area up in northern Minnesota. So this, these are um, our our best estimate of, of how much temperatures in lakes have changed in recent years based on what we know about what drives, drives water temperatures uh, today. And these temperatures, uh, uh, lake temperatures are expected to continue to increase. With Michigan showing the, the fastest rate of increase in the region. So let's turn to an example um, from Wisconsin Lakes, and this was based on uh, some recent observations from the uh, Wisconsin DNR survey of, of lakes. And what they found, and there were actually, it was sort of uh, also at the same time a lot of angler complaints uh, were coming in, um, was that uh, the graph on the left shows 
uh, the percentage of lakes um, um, and the amount of largemouth bass. And so what basically what they were seeing was there was an increase in the number of lakes um, that had bass and that, and that the proportion of bass was increasing in many of these lakes, especially in northern um, Wisconsin. And at the same time, walleye recruitment in lakes was going down. So walleye survival or production of walleye, the number of lakes that were supporting walleye were going down. So that lakes that were traditionally good walleye lakes, people bought cabins on so they could fish walleye all the time. They were seeing a decline in the numbers of walleyes they could catch, and they were seeing the increases in the number of largemouth that they were catching. And they weren't very happy because they didn't really care about largemouth bass. And this, this was, uh, they, they saw the trend, the anglers did, and, and the trend was also borne out in the surveys of these waters. And so they worked to try to understand what was, what might explain this. And here's just uh, uh, a plot that shows across the bottom temperature in, in degree days with cooler lakes on the left and warmer lakes on the right. Um, and a probability of occurrence of walleye there in the, the blue line and largemouth bass in the red line. And you, as you can clearly see, walleye prefer cooler lakes or lakes that have a shorter uh, uh, growing season, if you will. And the bass, of course, prefer warmer lakes. And then there's an area where the two intersect. And so you can clearly see that there are some lakes that are walleye lakes, and there's some lakes that are going to be dominated by largemouth bass, and then there's going to be some where they coexist. And what they were seeing is um, a shift more towards more largemouth bass in many of these lakes, and it was due to recent increases in lake temperature. And then they, so they established this relationship for, for recent temperature change, and then, um, and that's so that the, 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 the recent information on the left, um, which shows uh, green lakes are walleye lakes, the bass lakes are in red, the purple lakes are where the two coexist. And then when you look at mid-century uh, projections for habitat change based on climate change. You see that the proportion of, of uh, green lakes in that is pretty small. So those are the walleye lakes. You see a loss of walleye lakes across northern Wisconsin. A large increase in the lakes that support largemouth bass and um, an intermediate number of lakes then where the two are coexisting. So project big changes in, in lake habitats here and changes in, in the dominant species in these waters. This has big implications. This is northern Wisconsin where walleye is king. Um, so it has big, and there are parts of Michigan that are, that are very similar, have very similar mentality um, and similar habitat. So um, this is something that's likely going to be occurring um, in northern Michigan as well. So uh, the, the, uh, the fact that these two species coexist in some places complicates um, sort of our predictions for what, what may happen under climate change. Um, the fact that they may be, one may be a better competitor uh, depending on the temperature ha may have a big implication on um, uh, persistence of the other species. So there might be some additional effects beyond the direct temperature effect in these, these lakes. You can go online um, and check out these different scenarios and, and pan around the, the state of Wisconsin and, and see some of these results. So we've been, in Michigan, um, we've been trying to uh, assess the potential effects of climate change on, on lakes and streams. And we've been, we're particularly interested in trying to identify what species are most vulnerable to climate change and what, what lakes would be most vulnerable to climate change. Um, and so we've developed similar models 
um, that explain current distributions based on a variety of factors, including uh, water temperature. Then we rerun those models with future climate uh, scenarios and we're able to project how uh, habitat suitability for different species will change. And this is an example for largemouth bass. And the blue dots represent the lakes that are currently, we project to be currently uh, suitable for, for largemouth. <coughs> the green dots represent the places that are not currently suitable, um, but are likely to become suitable by mid-century. So a, a significant increase in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, the, dist their dist the distribution of largemouth bass is largely limited right now by the, that climate boundary in the Upper Peninsula. But there are a fair number of lakes in the northern lower um, that are fairly unsuitable for largemouth bass right now, but they, they're likely to increase. So this is where we expect to see that the potential interaction between walleye and walleye, I'm oh, sorry, largemouth and walleye, um, and interactions between walleye anglers and property owners, um, and, and uh, I guess the people responsible for man managing those, those waters. And here's a similar uh, projection for, for walleye. Walleye is a cool water species, as we, we talked about. Um, and again, that, so all the dots in this case represent lakes that are currently suitable for walleye. Those shown in red are those places we project to, to lose, lose walleye. They, they will no longer be suitable for walleye by mid-century. So pretty dramatic reduction um, in the number of lakes by mid-century. So we've done this for, uh, for quite a few species um, and, and then to, to identify how, how vulnerable species is, we just tally up their, their relative number of increases or decreases. So the proportion of lakes um, that are either, uh, that are likely to gain in suitability or to be lost in terms of their suitability. And so that's what that uh, the y-axis is showing whether, and the blue line is, the, is zero. Um, and so, and, and, and each of those uh, bars represent a different species. Um, and so if they're high up on the, on the top, then these are species that are likely to gain suitability in a lot of lakes in the state. Those below the line are, are species that are likely to to see a loss in, in the number, proportion of lakes that are suitable for them. So basically everything above the, the blue line are warm water species, species adapted to, to warm water environments. Um, this is, here's uh, pumpkin seed and bluegill and largemouth bass. Um, there's uh, a channel catfish and a mix of, of minnows and suckers out on the far end. Cold water species, we, we could have model those together um, as a group. So that's whitefish and lake trout and, and rainbow trout. Um, show a, a significant decrease as well as um, the other cool water species such as walleye, rock bass, smallmouth, um, and a few others. So now we have some idea, this, this is, these are the, what we call the winners and losers. Um, the interesting or the unfortunate <coughs> thing is that as an agency we spend a lot of time managing these species here um, and much less time managing those things going that direction. And so um, not only are we likely to expect dramatic um, changes for anglers and property owners, uh, but also for the way the agencies, management agencies, um, do business. We have some tough decisions to, to uh, grapple with as well. <coughs> to look at lake vulnerability, um, what we did here is basically tally up the number of species changes we project to, to occur in each lake. So if a lake is going to lose walleye, that's one. Might lose a cold water species, that, that's two. 
Um, it might gain largemouth, there's three, and gain others, and so on, so on, so forth, and so on. So what you see is the southern part of the state, uh, the blues and the greens um, have relatively few number of species changes. Um, but as you move upward into the state, into the yellow and the orange and the reds, we're talking about dramatic changes in fish habitat, um, dramatic losses in the in habitat for cool water and cold water species, and um, large increases in habitat for warm water species. This is due uh, in part to two things. One is that in the north, um, we have uh, 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 we'll start start over in the south. Um, in order to support cool or cold water species in the southern part of the state, you've got to be a really big and deep lake. All right, the, the cold water habitat is only only maintained by the fact that the lake stratifies and it's locked away from interacting with the, the atmosphere. In the north, like in the UP, we have a lot of lakes that, are, that support cool water fishes and, and sometimes cold water fishes. Um, and they're relatively shallow, but the climate is so much different that they're able to persist. Under a warming climate, that habitat goes away pretty rapidly. And so there's this difference, uh, this interaction between lake morphology and, and spatial differences in climate that uh, makes some of these northern lakes really sensitive to, to changes in temperature. The other thing that's going on, this is projected uh, change in mean annual air temperature um, in the state by mid-century, and the red areas are expected to have the largest amount of change. And so not only do we have lakes that are sensitive based on their morphology, uh, but we also expect to have larger increases uh, in the north. So that sort of a double whammy. All right, so we, we expect these changes in, in habitat suitability. Um, it doesn't mean that any point on there is going to go from a lake dominated by cold water fishes to all of a sudden being filled with warm water fishes, right? Uh, because in many instances, fish have to be on the moon. And we know that there are some, there are natural barriers. We have many lakes that are disconnected <coughs> from any river. They're, they're groundwater fed systems. Um, and so the only way new species are going to get in there is if, if we move them. This is a, a map just showing the watershed boundaries in the state. These are the natural watershed boundaries. Um, and this is those boundaries when you account for the fragmentation that's due to dams. And so you can see um, that we have now a we've created a series of very small patches that where water bodies um, are isolated from one another due to, due to these dams. And so we have a really uh, significant challenge when we think about changes in habitat suitability and whether or not species are able to, to colonize new waters. So one, uh, of course, uh, in the adaptation world, there's lots of talk about translocations and moving species around to, to facilitate these changes in, in habitat and, and um, inability to move. Um, the other issue, of course, we've got to think about is as we open up corridors for movement, we're opening up corridors for invasive species. So, certainly some challenges there. My last example is from uh, Minnesota Lakes. And Minnesota's been doing a lot of work with Cisco. It's a type of whitefish. Um, it's an important forage species for, for other game fish. Uh, it likes cold water. It lives in the bottom of lakes. And they're sort of a canary in a coal mine. Uh, Minnesota's been great about doing their standardized assessment of, of these populations, and they've, they've detected changes, uh, loss of uh, declining populations in, in Cisco. Uh, 
and regional analyses across Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin have, have also shown, and Indiana, have also shown a, a dramatic decline in this species. Uh, it's state threatened in Michigan. It's a species of concern in Wisconsin uh, for those very reasons. The figure here is, says they have 650 uh, lakes that support Cisco in, in uh, Minnesota. In, in Michigan, we have about 153 that were historically supporting Cisco. So we have fewer uh, of those populations historically. But as I said, um, Cisco rely on the, that cold, uh, well oxygenated waters and hypolimnion of these lakes that stratify. Um, so uh, deep clear lakes are, are the best, uh, but uh, the work that Pete Jacobson's done in, in Minnesota has shown that um, these populations are particularly sensitive to both climate change and land use land use effects. Um, and that's because, um, as most of you know, let's see, I, yeah, I can't do this. So here's the hypolimnion in a, in a stratified lake, and this is where the Cisco like to, to hang out. It's, it's cold in the summer time and typically well oxygenated. In the upper layers, here we have, this is where we have our al algal growth. Um, as that algae decays, it falls down. Um, as it decays, it consumes oxygen. That's, that's, that's a normal process in lakes. That process gets accelerated as the lakes receive more and more nutrients as we, we develop the landscape. And in many lakes, um, that the amount of anoxia has uh, will has increased to the point um, where it's uh, occurs so high up in the water column that temperatures are no longer suitable for these cold water species and they've been extirpated. Under climate change, we, have, we're, we expect with these longer growing seasons, we expect this period of stratification to last longer into the year and so that that, that uh, process of anoxia can, can occur longer and longer and we can see more and more losses of suitable habitat in the bottoms of these lakes. On the other hand, the warming that's happening is pushing that thermocline deeper and deeper. And so there, we're, we call that the, you know, the oxythermal squeeze. And so there's less and less habitat available for these cold water fishes. This sim a similar thing is actually happening, happening for cool water fishes as well, as that uh, anoxia rises and rises uh, and we have warming temperatures. There's, there's very little space for, for many of these species to uh, persist. Cisco are just particularly sensitive to this. So here we have climate interacting with land use um, to really affect fish habitat. Of course, these watershed threats uh, include urbanization as, as well as agriculture we're, I'm sorry, rural de development. Um, Pete, Pete's got a map of Minnesota showing the, the projected increases in population by county there. Michigan's map is, is a little bit different. Uh, we are expecting some, projecting some increases in population in, in some northern counties, but also a loss in other northern counties. So the, the relative sensitivity to, uh, 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 sensitivity of lakes to urban development is, is going to vary depending on where you are. But with development comes increases in runoff and, and typically with that comes increased nutrients as well. And there's uh, uh, are also projected increases in agriculture. Um, they've talked about that a little bit. Uh, the regional map does show increases in ag in the north. Um, Farming is projected to march northward, especially under um, uh, with with uh, irrigation. Uh, Pete likes to talk about uh, the big trend in in uh, Minnesota lakes. I'm sorry, Minnesota landscapes in the north. Um, potato farming is marching northward. 
uh, the demand for French fries is is uh, uh, and that and and center pivot ir irrigation is is allowing and warming climate is allowing um, these northern areas to be now suitable for um, for agriculture and it's threatening um, these these cold water habitats in these Cisco lakes. Uh, I think I have one other message here. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about this. So I'll come back now, um, and I'll, I'll just briefly talk, touch on those uh, potential solutions here again. Um, what Minnesota has done in the case of the the Cisco lakes, they've identified the lakes that are going to be likely to be the refuge lakes for these these fish um, in the future under climate change. They've picked their best lakes and they said, we want to protect those watersheds. We want to prevent them from being, the forest from being converted to uh, agricultural and urban development. And so they're uh, working to get uh, uh, conservation easements, um, do forest management planning, to help protect the forests uh, in those watersheds. Um, and now the nice thing is they have a pot of money that, uh, that they, can, they can do that with. Um, they can actually purchase land as well. So, uh, so protection of those, of those refuge watersheds is, is, is a, a critical thing. Um, we may not always have that option. Uh, things that we can do though to reduce the nutrients the effects of those nutrients and, and uh, sources of runoff um, will um, maybe our only option, but we certainly should, should pursue those, especially in the, the watershed planning process. Um, I did talk about uh, implementing best management practices, um, and then again, of course, uh, thinking about eliminating barriers to allow fishes to, to move between water bodies that may be changing uh, oh, and, and one final thing to think about, uh, when, when we think about uh, changing fish habitat and planning for that and dealing with that, uh, we need to remember that what's, what's driving that habitat within a lake is shaped by things operating at different spatial scales. So the climate is a big regional thing that affects lake habitat. What's going on in a lake's watershed is also important. And what's going on around the perimeter of the lake on the shoreline is also important. And so we can, we may not be able to deal with the, the, the regional piece, but there are a lot of things we can do in the watershed and, and around the shoreline. And I just want to acknowledge Gretchen, Gretchen Hansen and Pete Jacobson um, for their work in the uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota lakes. And they were uh, they happily provided information from their work. And I'll take any questions. All right.